Welcome back. Um, those of y'all at home, pause the video and copy this down. Also, pause the video again and copy that down. In the last lecture, you were introduced to different, uh, or rather the definition of a solution, solute, dissolved, and solvent. And we started looking at different ways to analyze it. We're gonna continue looking at different ways to analyze it. So here's a new question that we didn't ask yesterday. Is there an amount of solute that you can add to that solvent where the solvent will quit dissolving? Do you think there's a maximum amount? For example, if you're making Kool-Aid and you have your water solvent, do you think you can add so much stinking sugar that eventually the water will say no more and the sugar will just float around in the solution rather than dissolve? Well, of course the answer is yes, because a lot of y'all have sucked at making Kool-Aid and you can just see all the particles floating around while it's super duper sweet. This idea of different levels of a solution in regard to has it dissolved very much? Can it dissolve more? Has it maxed out? It's got some very simple vocab words to uh, go along with it. And it, these are called saturation points. So here's how it works. If the solution can dissolve more stuff, it's unsaturated. Now, careful with that word though. The word unsaturated doesn't mean there's nothing dissolved. It might mean there's nothing dissolved, but unsaturated just means that the solvent can dissolve more, whether or not it's dissolved any so far. Once a solution is saturated, it's maxed out. It means you have added the exact amount of solute that the solvents can dissolve. Beyond that, it's now super saturated. If you add one more crystal of solute beyond the saturation point, it won't dissolve because now you have super saturated, you've gone beyond its capacity, and now that little crystal is just gonna float around. So the definitions of unsaturated, saturated, and super saturated, they're pretty simple. But aside from the general vocab, we like to graph it as well. So let's talk about what a solubility curve is, because that's what's happening here. Check this out. Look at the axes first. Here, we've got the grams of solute, all right? So it's gonna be the amount of the solute that you've added in 100 grams of water. <coughs> solubility curves are going to assume that you're using the universal solvent of water, because it's usually the solvent, and it's going to assume 100 grams of it. So the whole graph is happening in 100 grams of solvent. What's changing as you climb up these graduations is going to be the grams of solute that you've added to the 100 grams of water. On your other axis is the temperature. And what you'll notice on the curve, see this brown line? This brown line is a random solute, a random salt probably. And you'll notice that as you increase the temperature, the amount of solute that can dissolve also usually increases as well. So here's what these problems will do, all right? You'll be given a situation. You'll be given a curve, all right? Again, this could be any different salt. Different salts have different curves, all right? But then it'll give you a situation. It'll be like, if you add 80 grams of that salt, that brown line, at 95 degrees Celsius, will it dissolve? The way that you know is based on the coordinates. So you'll find the grams added, you'll find the temperature, and you'll see where it lines up on the graph. And it'll hit somewhere in relation to its curve. If the coordinates it gives you for the amount added at what temperature is below the curve, then you're in the unsaturated world. Can it dissolve more at that point? Yes, by definition, right? So add the definitions to this. If the coordinates are below the line, it can dissolve more stuff. If it gives you a situation that lands directly on the line, all of those red points are the same. That's the saturation point. That means at that temperature and amount, it can dissolve exactly that amount. 
he's maxed it out though. Because the moment you have a point that's above the line, even if it's just a little bit above that curve, now you're super saturated and you have floating crystals. Questions? I have questions. Are you ready? Let's ask some questions. Now, take a look. Whoops. Uh, take a look at this. This is the same graph that I have on that paper, but you're going to have to decide which thing you want to look at. I didn't give you that paper because you have to memorize it or anything. It's just you have to be a little squinty up here because I know this is kind of small. But the downfall of the paper that you have is that the crosshairs, the lines that are coming from the axes, you can't see them on your paper um, for the most part. So maybe, I, I don't know what's easier to read for you. If you're in the back of the room, you probably need to use that paper. Anyway, here's what's going on on this solubility curve. You see how there's a bunch of lines? This isn't saying that you have a solvent that you're adding a bunch of different stuff to. No, no, no. These are all individual solutions, but they're put onto one solubility curve so that you can compare. All right. So these are a bunch of different solutes. These are all different solutes that could be added to 100 grams of water. And then the lines represent the rate at which they'll dissolve. And then we can ask you questions. I've got Aspen in play. I'm going to answer the first question, but then we'll get a little uh, pick on Yui. Are you ready? Watch how I do the first one. I know that's small. You don't have to write it. I'm just going to read it. What temperature will 100 grams of sodium nitrate become saturated? So make sure you're on top of what the vocab means. So here we go. Sodium nitrate is the light blue line right here. It wants to know at what temperature, so the answer is going to be one of the numbers down here, at what temperature will 100 grams of it hit the line? So 100 grams will be right there. There. So I'm just going to ride this line over until I hit the light blue line because that will be the saturation point. And I would say that it is between 30 and 40. All right. This is a little subjective since it's not hitting an exact line. So I don't know. Maybe 37 degrees is the answer. The good news is, is that Canvas and my test the answer choices will never be will never be vague. All right, so if you are reading it correctly, you're going to pick the right choice. But yeah, at about 37 degrees Celsius, you'll hit the saturation point of 100 grams of that solvent. You try one. How many grams of potassium nitrate will dissolve at 90 degrees Celsius? The potassium nitrate is this orangish line up here. How many grams of him will dissolve at 90 degrees Celsius? Now you're just giving me a general answer because there's a bit of subjectivity here. But let's go over to cluster six and talk to seat three. Hey, six, three, what do you think? I'm sorry? Around 15, around 50, do y'all agree or disagree with uh, 50 grams? Well, so if you look at the 90 degrees Celsius, Right? It wants to know how much will dissolve, which would be the saturation point. That's the maximum that can dissolve. So you want to go all the way up to the line. And there it is right there. And if I come over, it hits very close to 200. All right. So maybe, maybe a little bit more. But yeah, about 200 grams can dissolve. And the cool thing about this is that it's good chemistry. If I gave you 100 grams of water and I let you heat it to 90 degrees Celsius and then I gave you potassium nitrate, you could dissolve exactly that much. 
before it would stay crystalline and float to the bottom. I see this at home. I feel like it's blurry on my screen. Maybe that's better. All right, let's draw another card. There are six of these total, by the way, for those of y'all that care. Here's a yes or no question. Will 50 grams of sodium chloride dissolve at 20 degrees Celsius? Will 50 grams of sodium chloride, all right, which is way down here, this other orangish line, dissolve at 20 degrees Celsius? Let's go over to cluster two and talk to seat five. Hey, two five, what do you think? He said no. Do you like the answer no? It's a good answer because 50 grams is in between the 40 and 60 and 20 degrees Celsius. So if I go over on the 50 grams, there's 20 degrees Celsius. We are above the NACL line. Therefore, we are in super saturated zone where we've added too much. Will 130 grams of rubidium chloride dissolve at 99 degrees Celsius? The rubidium chloride is my red friend in the middle here. Will 130 grams of him dissolve at 99 Celsius? Let's go to cluster six. And talk to seat one. Hey, six one, what do you think? Do y'all like yes? I like yes. 130 grams is right here between the 120 and the 40. And it wants us to go all the way over to 99, which is going to be right here, which is below the red line. We are in the unsaturated zone. Therefore, it will dissolve. are very quiet. Thank you. At 80 degrees Celsius, 60 grams of ammonium chloride is best described as, and it wants a vocab word. So the ammonium chloride is my purple friend here. 80 Celsius, 60 grams. Let's go over to cluster six. We are hanging out there today. Seat one. Hey, six one again. I uh, got a vocab word. He says saturated. Do y'all like it? Some of y'all are shaking your head no. Some of y'all like it. Let's look. 80 Celsius is right there. And 60 grams. So if I run 60 grams all the way over to 80. Now it's close but it's actually below the line. All right, now again, there will be no ambiguity on Canvas like you might have thought there was there, but it's unsaturated at that point. Wanna do a harder one? Think I can make it more challenging? Here's our last question in this topic. How many grams of cesium chloride will be crystallized, that means undissolved, if you added 250 grams at 50 degrees Celsius. The cesium chloride is my very top dude here, my fuchsia friend. If you add 250 grams at 50 degrees Celsius, how many grams of crystallization will you have? Do I have any volunteers for an answer? Yeah. 
30 is perfect. Here's how he came up with 30 and was finally called perfect by the teacher. Um, 250 grams at 50. So 250 is right here between 240 and 260. And there's the 50. So if I run the 50 Celsius up to that point, it's super saturated compared to the purple line. But how much is it super saturated by? Well, the saturation point there is at 220. We're at 250. So we're super saturated by exactly 30 grams. That's the end of topic one. I have one other topic today, but it's faster. So take a look back at your opening in the dark slide. Another question we could ask ourselves about a solution once it's made is, will it conduct electricity? The way that you can tell whether or not a solution will conduct electricity is based on the identity of the solute that you've added to the solvent. So do me a favor and draw, I want you to draw some beakers with me. I'm going to draw four beakers. There's four beakers. Uh, Deacon, you're leaving. I'm going to fill all of the beakers with water. All right, they're all supposed to be the same size. There's not supposed to be any differentiation. All right, so they all have the same solvent. Do you agree? They do. What I want to do is put a different solute in each of them, and we'll see whether or not the resulting solution will conduct electricity. So I'm going to come up with some items. For the first one, I want to put an ionic compound in there. What's the other name for an ionic compound? Salt. If that doesn't come to your mind right away, you are behind. Ionic compounds and salts are the same thing. Anyway, I'm going to add potassium bromide to this beaker. When you add potassium bromide or any other ionic compound, Yeah, he's on his way. It will dissolve and dissociate, we say, into positive potassiums and negative bromine ions. And you see that plus and minus floating around? This makes it electrolytic. because soluble salts are called electrolytes. And in solution, they help conduct electricity. Your body is runs on electricity, right? Your brain runs on electricity. So yes, it's good to have these in your system because it helps everything move around. All right, hey, we have another beaker here. All right, I'm gonna kind of separate these off so that my pictures don't become confusing. All right, let's pick another type of compound. Let's talk about what if we picked a covalent? All right, what's another name for a covalent? It's also called a, ooh, definitely not that. Ooh, we don't know. If, if ionics are salts, all right, or crystals, then covalents are no metals. No Y'all are, this is painful chemistry. They're molecules. The answer is molecules. 
which is a non-metal to a non-metal. Anyway, so let's say what if we chose carbon dioxide? I'm going to put carbon dioxide in this one. Non-metal bonded to a non-metal. If I do that, pluses and minuses will not form. This is non-electrolytic. Covalent compounds when in solution will not allow the solution to conduct electricity. I know this is kind of boring on the whiteboard. In lab next week, I'm going to give you a bunch of solutions. I'm going to give you a light bulb connected to a probe, and I'm going to let you stick the probe in all the solutions, and you will see firsthand that all of this is true. We just don't have time today. Let's keep going, though, because I've got two more beakers here that feel very lonely. What if we added an acid? We know that acids are formulas that start with, hey, well, at least we knew that one. So what if we did HCl? Acids in solution will form ions. And if you have pluses and minuses floating around, then it's an electrolytic. And then we're a beaker away from the end of class. Shut up. I'm having fun. What if I added a base? Ooh, what do basic formulas usually end in? OH, hydroxide. All right, so what if we added sodium hydroxide? Bases as solutes will create ions. And if there's ions in the solution, it's electrolytic. Understand that it's the solutes that are either electrolytes or non-electrolytes. Acids, bases, and ionic compounds are electrolytes as the solute, forming an electrolytic solution. Covalent compounds are non-electrolytes in regard to the type of solute they are, so they create solutions that will not conduct electricity.